All right, so um, we are beginning the serving challenge this week. We've been talking about it for a couple of Sundays that this is coming, and so here it is, the serving challenge. Our theme scripture comes from Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, where the scripture says, the Son of Man, this is Jesus' words speaking about himself as the Son of Man. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's read that verse together. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And today we're kicking off this new sermon series, The Serving Challenge. It's a 40-day challenge. So it's a 40-day experience. So we want to encourage you to participate in this 40-day experience. There's uh, readings out of the book. The Serving Challenge book is available out in the commons. If you'd like to get a hold of that, there's uh, readings for 40 days. Um, how this works, like this is, this is the only day we can say this. None of you are behind. <laughs> because the first reading, if you look at the table of contents, the first reading, day one, is tomorrow. So nobody's behind. So you can grab your book today, and then next week we can say, yeah, some of you are behind. It won't be you. So there you go, uh, day one. And there's five readings for this week, so you get a day off at some point. So you could even start on Tuesday and not be behind um, this week, day one. So I encourage you to pick that up out in the commons uh, as you go. But so what do you, this is kind of the introduction then to what the series is going to be. So uh, that's what we're doing today is introducing things. So here's a statement and see what you think of this. Um, you were created to be great. You were created to be great. Some might react to that by saying, ooh, kind of sounds like a TV preacher. Name it and claim it and all that kind of stuff. Um, some might think of the Bible's command to us to be humble, and then here you were created to be great, and think to yourself, that statement's about as anti-Jesus as you could get, because Jesus calls us to humility, to be humble. Well, let's check out a scene from the goat, the greatest of all time, Jesus Christ himself. In Matthew chapter 20, two disciples of Jesus, James and John, along with their mother, come along and come, come over to Jesus, and they ask a favor of Jesus. This is, what, this is what it says. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons, James and John, came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want, he asked. And she said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit on your right and the other on your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to him. Can you drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup. But to sit on my right and left is not for me to grant. Those places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. So did you catch something really interesting about Jesus' reaction. I would have expected Jesus to condemn their thinking, to condemn them for wanting to be great. But he doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't rebuke them for what I thought he would rebuke them for. And I kind of find that fascinating. Jesus doesn't correct them for wanting to be first or wanting to be great. Why not? Well, it seems like the desire to be great is a God-given desire. We all have this, I think we have, this innate thing in us to be great, to want, by that I mean to want our lives to mean something, to want our lives to have significance, uh, to live lives of purpose and meaning. We hope our lives make a difference. We hope when it's all said and done that our lives matter, at least to somebody. So instead of rebuking them for their desire to be great, Jesus tells them they don't really know what they're asking. They don't really know what greatness is. That's their problem. Their desire is right, but their perception of what it takes to be great is the problem. Their perception of, of what greatness entails is wrong. That's not the true path to greatness. And, and so the account continues. Jesus corrects their understanding of what it means to be great. It says, when the ten, the other ten disciples heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Jesus called them all together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever 
wants to become great among you, that's okay, that's good, in fact. Whoever wants to become great must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus is um, claiming that true greatness does not come the way the world tries to attain greatness. Flaunting your authority as a leader, as high officials will do, ordering people around. It doesn't come through power. True greatness doesn't come through wealth or status or what seat you sit in. But greatness comes from a different path than that. Jesus says, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. So over the next 40 days, we're going to be diving into the teachings, the life, the ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus to discover from the Gojiso, the greatest servant of all time, how to be great. And we cannot be truly great. We can't have a life of significance first without knowing Jesus. That's the first step in a life of significance, a life that will last into eternity. That's the first step is to know Jesus, to receive Jesus himself. He says... He gives his life as a ransom for many, which is the Hebrew, it's a Hebraism thing. And when he says he gives his life as a ransom for many, he means for all. That's what the Hebrew means there. We can't have lives of true significance if we don't first know this greatest servant of all time, this Jesus who gave his life on the cross for you, who was sacrificed for you, who was raised from the dead on Easter morning for you. You have to know Jesus first before you can have a life of significance. Knowing Jesus first, receiving get the gift of eternal life from Jesus first is the beginning of a path toward a life of significance, eternal significance. So check out, um, we're gonna kinda check out an earthly example of greatness, and um, I'm not endorsing everything about this person because they're not Jesus, but it's greatness lived out on the basketball court, and some of you may throw things at me by naming this name, but anyway. LeBron James. Okay. All right. So I know, I don't know if he's the GOAT or I, I, I think Michael Jordan personally, but, or somebody else, you, you can argue all about that over lunch. All right. But here's a pattern with LeBron James is before he goes to a team, they're generally not great. While he's on the team, the team is great. And then when he leaves the team, they're even worse than when he got there. They're like total trash, garbage. So the question is, is the team great or is LeBron great or what's going on there? And so, and here's the evidence for this about teams kind of going up and down with and without LeBron. There's four times that LeBron has joined a team. And uh, even when he was just a rookie, including that, when he was just a rookie. And in those four times, the team's win total goes up the following year by 16 on average. And then when he leaves a team, which he does, uh, the team's win total goes down by 30. They get 30 more losses than they had the previous season. So there's like this pattern that happens. So like literally one time he left the Cavaliers, the Cleveland Cavaliers, and they went from um, second best record of all 30 teams down to the worst record the next year. It's just a dramatic drop. So somehow when LeBron's on the court, it changes the dynamic for everything that's going on. Um, here's another statistic for you that I, th I think is just amazing. So an NBA game has 48 minutes. LeBron is on the court an average of 38 of the 48. Okay. Um, an NBA, here's another stat, a 48-minute game. LeBron has the ball in his hands how much? Between five and six minutes. Five to six minutes, that's how much he has the ball in his hands in a 48-minute game. It's like, that's not very much. And a lot of people know he's first all-time in scoring, but did you know he's fourth all-time in assists? Fourth in assists. Most of us, when we think of greatness, and this is kind of the point, when we think of greatness, we think of having the five minutes we got the ball in our hand or the six minutes we got the ball in our hand. It turns out that greatness actually is established the other 42, 43 minutes of the game. That's when the greatness is established. And even more than that, it's established in the minutes and the hours and the days and the weeks and the months and the years of practice, 
of preparation. Malcolm Gladwell uh, has a lot of interesting books out, and, and uh, one of the things he says is it takes 10,000 hours to become truly proficient at something. And of course, if you want to be great, you've got to even more than that. 10,000 hours of practice before you actually can do something in a proficient way. That's a lot of practice. That's where greatness is made, is when nobody else is looking. So here's kind of the truth from this modern day, maybe goat, maybe not, you can argue a basketball. Greatness is found in a team. It's a team game, not an individual. And I'm not saying LeBron always valued team. We're gonna have a big argument so I can tell on the way out, but anyway. Um, but somehow he made others around him better. He made his team better. He's fourth in assists. You don't become fourth in assists without throwing the ball to somebody else who scores. That's how that happens. So in the series, we're gonna learn not from LeBron, that's just an example, but from Jesus, because Jesus is by far greater than LeBron. Philippians 2 verses 5 to 11 tells the story best of Jesus serving and his greatness found in serving, I think. So over the next five weeks, we're gonna look at five aspects of serving like Jesus. We're gonna learn from Jesus about the serving and really gonna follow through Philippians 2 and other scriptures as well. Uh, and if you're following along in the 40 Day Challenge book, you'll get to read this and, and uh, yeah, it'll be kind of work all together. So here's the order of the five things. Philippians 2 verse five starts it out. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as that of Christ. So first thing we're gonna look at is the mindset of Jesus, the attitude of Jesus. His attitude shapes how he serves. And as we see Jesus' attitude, his mindset, what we're gonna see is that his attitude toward us, whom he serves, is love. He loves us. He just does, he loves you personally. That's the attitude that Jesus comes to this. And in the same way, as we think about serving, one of the first things we gotta do is get our attitude right, to love the people we're serving, to just love them the way they are. That's how Jesus is with us. And then Philippians continues, it says, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage, but rather he made himself nothing. Jesus became available to us. He didn't just stay up in heaven with his heavenly father, but he came down to earth. He made himself available. He left his throne in heaven and came down to earth, was available for you and me. And we'll look at what it means, how we can be available to serve others in the midst of the busyness of our life. Crazy, chaotic world. And sometimes what, what stops us from serving is not our attitude, but it's our availability. How can we be available to serve others in the midst of the life that we have? Philippians continues, Jesus made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Attitude, availability, and then he did something about it. He actually had an action, he humbled himself. He actually left his throne in heaven and came to earth. I wonder how many dreams, how much potential goes unrealized because we don't take action because we don't actually do it. We just dream about it, we just think about it, we just wish it could happen, we just hope it might happen, but we don't take action. A life of serving is not a life of sitting on the sidelines and hoping maybe this will happen, but it's actually taking action. And then Philippians continues, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, ability. Jesus has a unique ability, the unique ability to bring forgiveness of sins to everybody, to all of you and to me. Jesus has, we, we don't, we're not Jesus. You're not Jesus. I can tell you that. I'm not Jesus. We can't save the world. But we do have abilities. You and I you each uniquely have a set of abilities, a set of gifts that God has given to each one of us to serve best in this world, to live up to the greatness that God's called us to as servants, we need to figure out what are the abilities that God has given to us to discover our abilities and then be able to put them in action. And then finally this, therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, 
and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Ambition. The last A is ambition. Ambition for what? Ambition that our service might bring glory to God, that people might say, thank God for that service I received. That we might bring Jesus into the ears of people around us. We exist for those who don't yet know Jesus. When people know Jesus, God gets the glory. And so we go low so God can be glorified, so God can receive honor. So five aspects are attitude, availability, action. It's kind of availability and ability kind of get confused, but attitude, availability, action, ability, and ambition are the five aspects. And when, we, when we're immature, we tend to um, think living out our dreams means crushing everybody else, kind of like James and John did when they went to ask that question of Jesus. When we're immature, it's all about finding our own destiny. You know, Lord, can we sit on your right and your left in your kingdom? You know, we want to be rulers here. But part of becoming mature in our walk with Jesus is realizing that greatness comes through serving. That significance in our lives comes through passing the ball to somebody else, to blessing others. That's where significance comes in. That greatness, truly being truly great, is thinking, how can I bless others today? Greatness comes from taking our gifts and our talents and our passions, our resources, everything that God's giving to us, and instead of hoarding it, giving it away to bless other people. Jesus called James and John and the rest of his disciples that day to live differently than everybody else, to have a different definition of what it means to be great, to have a different idea of what they're aspiring to. We can't give our lives as a ransom for many like Jesus did. We have different gifts. We can't give our lives to save the whole world for eternity. But we can give our lives to serve others around us, whoever God's placed in our path, to bless, to bless others whom God has placed in our path. And that is the path to greatness, humbling ourselves, serving others as Jesus did. Let's stand.